Yes, thank you very much for coming to our lecture today. I think that uh, we have something to look forward to. Uh, our guest speaker today is Dr. Surti Singh, the most recent, uh, acquired, recently acquired member of the department. And uh, I think a great success with our students as far as I can tell. Dr. Singh uh, is going to talk to you about uh, Adorno and, the, and uh, his philosophy of art in connection with uh, one, a famous contemporary painter, Richter. Um, I think it is quite interesting to hear something about Adorno. I don't know who is familiar with his writings of you, but uh, in the 60s, uh, during the student movement, Adorno was one of the great, great uh, sources and uh, uh, inspirating powers of the student movement. But uh, I think uh, he was just criticized for exactly what Dr. Singh will talk about today, that is to say, for his relation to art. And uh, I find it therefore particularly interesting to hear what she has to tell us, because it promises to be a new and different Adorno, and, um, but it reflects also her interests in both political philosophy and aesthetics. But she will tell you something about a uh, new reading of his concept of experience. I hope you have right? Sure. <laughs> Why not? Uh, in, uh, and his contribution to a different understanding of the arts. I think it's enough for now. Let's just go and uh, listen to her. Thank you very much. Yeah. Is this on? Is it on? Yes, okay. All right, so the, the title of my paper is, uh, as Dr. Stelzer was saying, uh, Adorno, Richter, and the Work of Art. So um, Richter and Adorno are what I would call liminal figures. Richter paints and Adorno writes about art during a moment in which the existence of art itself comes into question. In a moment of historical crisis, when traditional forms of art, such as painting, are threatened by the age of mechanical reproduction, photography, digital technologies, postmodern ideologies, and the marriage of art and commerce. Richter and Adorno are liminal figures because they are exceptionally critical of this obsession with the new that marks the 20th century. But at the same time, they are also equally critical of retreating into the past or embracing a conservative position with respect to tradition. Instead, Richter and Adorno occupy a remarkable place in between, with Richter refusing to abandon painting even while acknowledging proclamations about its end, and Adorno refusing to abandon critical reflection upon art, even amidst the failure of philosophy to adequately grapple with modern art. Both thinker and artist then work through the contradictions that embody and threaten their respective media, and thereby develop an art and philosophy that is precisely of the present, in a way that neither rushes blindly into the future nor nostalgically clings to the past. So this confluence between Richter's artworks and Adorno's aesthetic theory formed the backdrop for my talk today, which investigates the work of art after what has been called the end of art and the historical catastrophes that have accompanied it. For what do we mean by the end of art except that a certain kind of art, a certain kind of work of art is no longer possible? And that in turn, we also lose the capacity for a certain form of, of reflection upon art, given the failure of the medium itself to persist. Indeed, it is self-evident, Adorno writes, that nothing concerning art is self-evident anymore, not its inner life, not its relation to the world, not even its right to exist. And it is from this experience of loss that Richter paints and Adorno writes, but that, as I'll argue today, is not wholly negative, not wholly pessimistic. In fact, it is precisely by dwelling with the negative that Richter and Adorno, paradoxically, hearken the possibility for something radically new.
So in what follows, I first contextualize both Adorno and Richter's stance toward modern art within the larger debate about the relationship between art and philosophy. And then I turn to Adorno's discussion of modern art in relation to this historical debate and elucidate the particular character by which modern art both affirms the status quo and yet has the capacity to transcend it. And then lastly, I'll turn to some of Richter's paintings and draw from both his figurative and abstract works. Um, and I can sort of leave that open to discussion towards the end, a sort of uh, example of, of what I'll be talking about in the paper. So um, art and philosophy. So as early as Plato's expulsion of poetry from the Republic, art has continually struggled to establish itself as a legitimate form of knowledge. It is well known that Plato's casting of the poets out of the ideal society marked the origin of the antipathy of philosophy toward art, insofar as art could not have any part in truth. For Adorno, the separation of philosophy and art, which was enacted in order to protect the domain of truth, quote, tends toward the destruction of truth, end quote. That is, the separation of philosophy and art leaves both isolated. And although philosophy has historically attempted to close the gap between them, and we can think of the great aesthetics of Kant or Hegel, Adorno deems that these efforts have largely failed. Philosophy has historically chosen the side of the concept to the detriment of the artwork. So with the advent of modern art, a new stance towards this tension comes about with art, instead of being subservient to philosophical reason, now wields the capacity to uproot, challenge, and threaten philosophical reason. Art establishes itself as its own sphere of knowledge, and many third-generation critical theorists, such as Christoph Menke and Martin Seale, take up precisely this power of art to critique our philosophical discourses. So this idea of modern art as somehow being a sphere of its own knowledge um, is predicated on the idea that art can give us a certain kind of knowledge that philosophy no longer can. So just as we see uh, Plato inaugurating the antipathy of philosophy toward art, the origin of aesthetics as a separate field from philosophy marks the strife between art towards philosophy. So if from a philosophical perspective, this antith antipathy is because of philosophy's desire to retain its purity and not be contaminated by the non-reason of art, this strife takes on a new meaning with Baumgarten's designation of aesthetics as its own field in his Aesthetica from 1750. So for example, Menke writes that, quote, the ancient conflict between philosophy and poetry, and for poetry we could substitute art in general, of which Plato speaks, was a conflict concerning the custodianship of practical knowledge that guarantees culture and community. Before, in, and still long after Plato, philosophy and art struggle about the seed of wisdom. Both sides lay claim to the ability to lead to practical knowledge, more precisely, the knowledge that serves or indeed is necessary to the good life. And both dispute the other side's ability to redeem this claim by, means, by its own means. Philosophy disputes the fact that art even disposes of knowledge, and poetry or art disputes the fact that philosophical knowledge is practically useful. So we can see this tension um, in the recent 2011 documentary, I don't know if any, anybody has seen it, uh, called Gerhard Richter Painting, in which Richter pointly wonders if, quote, to talk about painting is perhaps pointless. You can only express in words what words are capable of expressing, what language can communicate. Painting has nothing to do with that. Painting is another form of thinking, end quote. It is poignant that Richter refers to painting as another form of thinking, for historically, art has been removed from the arena of thinking and relegated to the level of intuition or even instinct. So in calling painting another form of thinking, what may appear to be a glib remark on Richter's part and a resistance to discussing his artwork with the public, actually, I would argue, expresses a deeper tension in the work of art itself. This capacity for art to become its own sphere of thinking is inherently tied to the development of modern society, um, as Adorno would argue, and in particular, the advent of the Enlightenment and the rise of capitalism. So um, I want to pursue a little bit how um, Adorno would conceive of art um, as being sort of its own sphere of knowledge or its own sphere of thinking uh, by looking at some of the paradoxes of modern art. So in his aesthetic theory, uh, Adorno discusses the aut autonomy of art by pointing to the development of enlightenment reason, which, um, as, as we know, allowed for a disenchantment of the world 
and that freed art from its subservience to religion, magic, and cultish activities. So art could develop as its own autonomous sphere of activity, guided by its own values, rather than simply serving as the medium of expression for other spheres, such as religion. Yet, as Adorno will argue, this autonomy of art also suffered from the formal instrumental rationality that made its autonomy possible. So Adorno sees enlightenment reason as being a kind of formal or even means to end rationality, which is governed by calculation rather than meaningful values, and importantly excludes substantive knowledge. So in Max Weber's analysis of modern society, for example, that influences Adorno's account, art develops according to its own logic, but this development is disconnected from any kind of meaningful reflection upon the nature of art itself. Furthermore, not only is art unable to reflect upon its purpose or worth, it is powerless or becomes powerless to question the other value spheres of society as well. So in other words, art achieves its autonomy in modern society, but its autonomy comes at the price of becoming isolated and ineffectual with respect to the role it can play within society at large. Now this is sort of Max Weber's analysis, and Adorno, while drawing on Weber, um, also differs Right? Because in contrast to Weber, for Adorno, art is not simply helpless. So although art will, reproduces the dominant logic of reality, right, which is, uh, in this case, enlightenment reason that is calculating, quantifying, instrumental, for Adorno, it also has the capacity to contest it. And so Adorno pursues this aspect of art by examining artworks within their material process of production um, so to sort of supplement Weber's analysis. So for Adorno, on the one hand, the aim of modern art's autonomy was to create a sphere with its own independent values. But again, the result is an autonomy that replicates the dominant logic of empirical reality. So this means that the more that art tries to separate itself from society, the more it tries to really establish itself as its own sort of realm of values, um, it, the more, art, Adorno argues, it falls under the spell of the same society it wants to separate from. And so in this respect, Adorno will say that the autonomy of art creates a kind of illusion or semblance that art is separate from the material realm of commodities, for example, because art has its own unique quality as a work of art. Right? But that Adorno will argue is separation that in reality is impossible under the conditions of instrumental reason. So he says, quote, artworks detach themselves from the empirical world and bring forth another world, one opposed to the empirical world as if this other world too were an aut autonomous entity, end quote. So in this way, art's uh, autonomy is ideological because it masks the fetish character that it shares with all of the things produced under capitalism. Adorno claims that artworks can be charged with, quote, false consciousness and chalked up to ideology, end quote, since they promote themselves as something spiritual, independent from the material condition of their production, and they purport themselves to be untouched by the dominant logic of reality. So here Adorno is directly drawing from Marx's critique of commodity production, in which all objects produced within capitalism are manufactured according to their exchange value rather than their, rather than their use value. Uh, that is, according to what they will fetch on the market, rather than any kind of inherent useful value. Yet, Adorno does not suggest that art's fate is sealed. So, on the one hand, again, Adorno shows that um, art claims to be an independent sphere um, and is something that is, um, uh, has some kind of quality that allows it trans to, tran to transcend its um, status as a commodity. And Adorno says that this is an illusion because under the dominant logic, no object can sort of escape this kind of dominant commodity logic. However, right, on the other hand, Adorno says, while artworks fall into this kind of dominant logic, they also have the capacity to transcend it. And this is because he'll argue, and this is really interesting in Adorno, that it's precisely because they are guilty of fetishism that is, it's precisely because they are commodities that they actually express a freedom from this domination. So art's autonomy is emancipatory because its illusory character is generated by the wish for something non-illusory, for something that might transcend art's current formation as a fetish object. So in, in purporting itself to be autonomous, 
it expresses the wish for an autonomy that it otherwise can't achieve within the dominant logic of capitalism, within the dominant logic of enlightenment reason. Um, so arts autonomy generates the wish for something non-illusory. So art's illusory character is ideological insofar as it conceals its production process as a fetish, and it is true insofar as it anticipates something that does not yet exist, precisely the production of an object that does not have exchange as its end goal. So in this way, quote, artworks are plenipotentiaries of things that are no longer distorted by exchange, profit, and the false needs of a degraded humanity, end quote. So modern artworks are a product of the empirical world, but in the same construction repudiate the means and relation of reality. So Adorno writes that, quote, it's only by its double character, which provokes permanent conflict, that art succeeds at escaping the spell by even the slightest degree, end quote. So through their semblance character, artworks seem to offer the possibility of transcendence from the logic of reality. And Christian Lotz, who writes on Adorno, has recently explained this kind of dynamic in art. Quote, this transcendence can be achieved by the work of art because it is able to push us and itself beyond the everyday world and to leave behind all instrumentality encountered in the world. This transcendence is the experience of liberation, according to Adorno. On the one hand, this possibility of a breakthrough is a real possibility. And on the other hand, it remains a semblance. End quote. Um, so in other words, uh, art gives us an image or an intimation of a world that does not yet exist. It is utopian, it is emancipatory, it is redemptive. And yet this aspect of artworks is semblance insofar as artworks are a product of the same society that gives them rise. They embody the same logic and therefore artworks are paradoxical. They give us an intimation of the future only to hide it away from us before we can truly grasp it. So, uh, both Adorno and Richter maintain and play with this duality of the artwork. They share a fundamental concern with something other than the existing world, and we might call it even a metaphysical impulse, whether this is conceptualized as utopia, reconciliation, redemption, or transcendence, but which they express through the material practice of painting and critique. And importantly, for both Richter and Adorno, it's not tied to any kind of positive representation. Instead, uh, for both, art's hopefulness emerges precisely through the destruction and negation of artistic form. So any kind of uh, hope for transcendence for both Richter and Adorno is tied to a negativity, to a destruction of what exists, and sort of, sort of like a destruction of the artwork's own logic. And so we'll see this um, through Richter's work. So exactly in the second part of this paper, I'd like to turn to Richter. Um, and which I'd like to frame very briefly with a thought of Adorno from an early essay um, of his entitled The Culture, Culture Industry. So uh, writing in 1944 with his intellectual partner Max Horkheimer, Adorno saw a contradiction with respect to art emerging at the early inception of capitalism. And so he notes a story about Beethoven. And Adorno writes, quote, the mortally sick Beethoven who flung away a novel by Walter Scott with the cry, the fellow writes for money, while himself proving an extremely experienced and tenacious businessman in commercializing the last quartets, works representing the most extreme repudiation of the market, offers the most grandiose example of the unity of the opposites of market and autonomy in bourgeois art. So this kind of unity, right, between on the one hand um, trying to affirm some kind of purity or autonomy to art, and yet at the same time being subject to the same commercial imperative, is something that's being becoming more and more evident in Richter's career. Uh, Richter's remarkable career spans many decades and has demonstrated an unconventional ability to, to traverse numerous, numerous styles of painting, such as portraits, landscapes, abstractions, and most recently digitally produced works of art. Um, the commercial success of Richter's paintings, coupled with the spate of exhibitions offering retrospectives and the release of a new documentary about his painting in 2011, have only served to edify his status. Yet Richter is a complicated artist whose works embody the paradoxical quality of both being commercially successful and yet as having the reputation for being difficult, challenging, and expressive of the dominant crisis within the discipline of art itself. 
Um, as be, has, has been noted by some of Richter's interviewers and commentators, Adorno's theories about art are often implicit in Richter's views. And thus, at the moment in which Richter has achieved some of his highest commercial success, it is perhaps poignant to revisit this Adornian impulse in his work and to assess whether an artist can be both a critic of existing reality on the one hand and a commercial success on the other, as it seems that Richter has become. Um, so I'm going to talk about, um, and I want to sort of show these images before I return uh, to the sort of the paper. I'm going to talk about both um, some examples of his figurative work and some examples of his abstract works. And um, I, th I think it's, it would be very interesting to talk about Richter's corpus as a whole because it's so varied and different, but due to time constraints, um, it'd be better just to look at sort of these two different impulses, almost competing impulses in, a, in, in Richter's work. Um, and so the first um, paintings I'm gonna show are um, actually four paintings that are hanging uh, in the Art Institute of Chicago. And they're entitled Ice 1, 2, 3, and 4. And these are um, Richter's abstractions uh, that were painted in 1989. So I'll just pull this up uh, quickly before I of Richter um, with his painting technique. Um, it's, it's basically um, a work of art that's been created through the layering of, of paint um, on top of paint uh, by a squeegee. Um, and Richter, what he does is he applies paint and then he'll take the squeegee and rub it over uh, the, the previous layer. And what this will do is it create the effect of kind of layering paint upon paint. But at the same time, um, when he sort of runs that squeegee over it, it also will sort of um, unearth some of the, the, the layers that are underneath and expose color, um, expose different textures through the top layer. Um, so, uh, and he uses alternating horizontal and vertical strokes or pulls of a scraper. And so again, each scraper kind of adds a layer, but in places also scrapes off the existing paint. Um, and so I want to um, talk about these paintings, these abstracts, but I just want to show you the figurative side of his work as well, and then I'll sort of talk about those, those two uh, together. So the, the figurative works I'm going to show are um, the famous, or the infamous paintings that he did um, of the Bader Meinhof gang. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with those works, um, so I'll just show those to you as well, and then I'll talk about both together. 
as you can see, uh, the series that I've shown are extremely different in style, um, and they were actually painted in, in very relatively close proximity. Um, Richter did uh, these, these uh, Bader Meinhof paintings first, and then immediately after turned to abstraction and did the ice paintings. Um, so the, the, the photos that I have up now that I sort of look through uh, are the photo paintings, um, and then there are series that are called um, 18 October 1977. It's a 15 panel series that addressed an event that at the time really shocked Germany, and it was the group suicide in prison and under somewhat suspicious circumstances of members of the terrorist Red Army faction or Bader Meinhof gang. And um, in October 1977, the series was Richter's first paintings to address an overtly political theme. Um, and so some of the paintings that you saw are of uh, these actual members, right, and, and who, have, who, are, who are deceased, and that he's sort of recreated in these, in these very dark images. And when the exhibition um, was held, uh, it, even though I think it was in 1989, um, it created a lot of controversy because the memory of these events were still very vivid in, in the public. And so there was a very direct kind of political connotation to what um, Richter was doing. Um, and then again, uh, right after doing this series, he then turns to um, abstraction. And as I showed the ice paintings, they're extremely different in style and have no kind of political content, right? They're, they're pure abstractions. Um, and yet, both styles um, share something similar in terms of their stance towards the history of painting. Right? On the one hand, you have these very dark, foreboding um, images, these paintings done of these deceased members of the Bader Meinhof gang. And in taking up this political theme, uh, Richter is sort of inciting reflection on the role of photography, both what photography has done to painting as a medium, but also what painting can, can incite us to think about when it comes to the photographic rendition of things like um, a murder or the death of these individuals. And so um, for, for, uh, for Richter, it's not only the content of these works of art that are important, right, as paintings of this sort of political episode, but also in terms of how it's positioning itself uh, in terms of uh, art's capacity to incite thought or to convey some kind of knowledge about these events. And rather than um, trying to offer a kind of photographic or realistic account um, by smudging the images, uh, by, by making them even more gloomy and more terrifying than they are in the actual photos, uh, Richter is asking us to sort of um, delve more deeply into the, the deeper issues. So what I mean by the deeper issues is when this uh, exhibition was again shown maybe 10 years later, uh, the memory of the actual events had faded, and also this exhibition was shown in America instead of Germany. And so the connection was different in terms of whether the audience even knew about the political events that inspired uh, these paintings. However, uh, they, they still managed to create that same effect of, of kind of uh, fear or horror or um, sort of uh, shock, and not, not shock in the sense of surprise, but in the sense of seeing a deceased individual painted in this kind of foreboding tone. And so for Richter, again, uh, it's not so much the content, but the form and the way in which um, this kind of photographic evidence is being conveyed that has the deeper sort of impact in terms of questioning art's capacity to, to uh, incite reflection. Um, similarly, the abstract paintings uh, were painted, again, without uh, not only political intent, but even, uh, Richter would argue, with any kind of organizational intent. That is, Richter paints these abstracts and allows the work of art itself to unfold. And if you watch the documentary, you see him sort of going through um, different layers, waiting a day or two before applying another layer, and um, allowing what he says, the artwork to determine when the, when the work is finished. So if we saw with the, uh, the political paintings a kind of negation of photography or a commentary on the negation of photography by painting, here we see with the abstract uh, works of art a kind of commentary on the ways in which photography has negated uh, the, the capacity of painting in its traditional sense. So in some respects, after the, at the end of painting or the death of painting, you have only um, sort of 
these abstract works of art that pursue their own ends or pursue their own aims. So in both respects, uh, Richter is trying to maintain a traditional art form in a radically changed environment, um, in an environment where technology has fundamentally thrown uh, that very activity into question. Um, and so in taking up both these, uh, these different styles or these dif different contents, what they have in common is um, this idea of negation, right? So even when we see the, uh, the, the abstract uh, works of art that sort of have this interplay between um, the cold industrial appearance of the work with its gray and white layers of paint through which because of the scrapes and scratches reveals a hidden sort of subterranean nature exposed in vivid slashes of red and yellow. Um, these paintings, while not explicitly giving us any kind of political content, um, seem to offer a meditation on the destruction of nature, on the role of technology, um, and, and the persistence of nature within the mechanized and industrial world of modernity. And so the abstracts as well are not mere, merely formal, but demand reflection in the viewer. Um, so in eliciting this question about the connection between life and death, between nature and culture, between freedom and instrumentality, between violence and reconciliation, um, Richter's artworks, both the figurative and the abstract, demand that we dwell with a negation of the aesthetic image, a negation that compels us as the spectators, as the viewers, to search for some kind of truth content of this artwork, uh, even admits its ruinous presentation. Um, so we can, we can argue, or I'm going to argue following Adorno, that Richter's paintings are negatives. Right? They're negatives of paintings, painting itself, they're negatives of photographs, um, and Richter's paintings themselves stand to the history of painting as a kind of double negation. Right? You see the negation of photography by photo painting, and you see the negation of painting by photography, without either one achieving any kind of resolution. So from within the negation of form, then, from, from both sides, from the abstractions and the figurative paintings, there emerges what Adorno would call a hope for a labor or for a work of art that goes beyond the alienation of craft, conception, and technology. Um, in this sense, a hope for a work of art that is not purely um, informed by the commodity logic. So in this respect, Richter's artworks enact a destruction of the artwork even while taking up explicitly political themes, um, even while uh, painting these abstract works of art in order to point towards a different kind of work that artworks can endure or undertake. Um, I think I've gone on for over half an hour, so I'll leave the, the paintings open maybe for discussion um, and, and stop there, so thank you. Who has a question, please? Yes. Hi. <laughs> I uh, do not understand that contradiction or the, even the relationship between rationality and art. I mean, why would art be irrational in some way? Why would art be irrational? Yes. Um, well, Adorno is not arguing that, that art is irrational, and that's not what I was trying to present. Um, it was more so that the development of modern art, to some extent, uh, questions its, its relationship to rationality. So if art has historically been seen as something irrational or something merely intuitive, um, modern art sort of um, calls that characterization into question. And actually, according to you know, theorists like Adorno, art has the capacity for some form of rationality, um, but not necessarily the kind that you would encounter within the sphere of philosophy. So it doesn't have the same work as philosophical reflection, although it can, it can and, and, and does, according to Adorno, um, incite some kind of critical reflection. Does that answer your question? Okay. Um, he did write quite a bit about music, yeah, so how would you see that connection? Yeah, he, he writes a lot about atonality um, and also this kind of interplay between music, 
that is, you know, very commercially driven, uh, repetitive, standardized on the one hand, and then music, musical forms that can actually challenge that kind of um, instrumentality. Yeah. Sure, yeah, and this is the this is the whole reason why I thought Richter would be interesting to analyze from an Adornian perspective, because he sees the two coexisting. It's not that he's saying work a work of art can or ought to abandon the commercial imperative. It, it, I don't think he would even say that that's possible within our existing conditions. But he is saying, um, can we, is there some way in which art is not only about that, that end goal, right, of exchange on the market, or the end goal of how it's going to be received by an audience? Is there a way in which artworks do some other kind of work, right? Is there, is there a way in which artworks participate in knowledge? Is there a way in which art maybe has a truth content that is something different from, you know, how famous the work of art is going to be or how much it's going to get on the market? Um, what do you mean? Yeah, I mean, so what's interesting with Richter's work is that um, the the paintings that have been gaining sort of the, the most attention or that have been selling for the highest price are actually sort of abstract works, but that are seen as being very kind of beautiful in a traditional sense. So um, they're very harmonious, the colors are very bright, and they're very sort of easy to look at. And and so the argument has been made by some critics that something like these these political paintings would never, you know, get as much on the market because who wants to hang sort of a picture of a deceased person over their, you know, living room, over their sofa, right? So again, it, it, Richter is a complicated artist for that reason because some of his works are seen as, you know, they're even, you know, there's a, one very cynical critic who is writing about how even the size, you know, of the, the paintings are, you know, good for hanging in your yacht or something like that, right? And then on the other hand, you have these very dark, disturbing works within his corpus. So um, I think, you know, whether a work is controversial doesn't necessarily mean that it will gain the highest price in the market, right? Not necessarily. I would disagree. Yes. I have a question. Um, I think it's sometimes interesting to um, contextualize painters, for instance, to compare, let's say, um, Richter to Anselm Kiefer, mm -hmm. who's a very different kind of artist. Now, Kiefer, one can see how sign and image uh, are related to one another in an ambiguous way, in that sign and image are opposed to one another, they're juxtaposed, and it creates a kind of tension within the work itself. As it seems to me that Richter, on the other hand, uh, there's a concern specifically with perception, and that it's it's as if the image is always breaking down, or as if the image is is being placed in a kind of against a kind of backdrop, which introduces an element of drama, which, however, one has a hard time interpreting. So my point is that maybe this is superficial, but it seems to me that Richter is more clearly engaged with some of the traditional problems of aesthetics precisely because of the way in which he he might be negating perception, but at the same time, perception is to some degree what's being foregrounded in contrast to what goes on, let's say, in the paintings of, let's say, Anselm Kiefer. Mm -hmm. So that's... Yeah, I would agree. I mean, if you think about his relation, or his attitude even towards the beautiful and the ugly, right? So the beautiful, which is dominated... Um, 
aesthetics uh, until you have the emergence of, of works of art that can be considered ugly, not simply by their content or by their, but purely on a formal level. Um, you know, if you, again, the, the documentary is very interesting because you see him going through this process of painting his works. And at some point, the work will emerge and it's, it's a beautiful work of art. It's harmonious. And um, they'll interview some of the people that are his attendants, for example, and they'll say, you know, the, the work looks, work, work, the work looks great, but don't tell, don't tell Richter because he'll destroy it. And he does. He'll, he'll sort of take a work of art to its, its this, this sort of peak and then paint over it, right? Or, or scrape it or destroy it. And so there, I think I would agree with you that there is some kind of explicit commentary on sort of these aesthetic concepts that have otherwise dominated the history of thinking about art. I mean, I, I don't. I don't see Adorno as inheriting Hegel's dialectics whole scale because that that element of the sublation, that moment where the negatives reconciled, is is missing. And you know, if you read negative dialectics, but even the way that the negative is playing itself out in aesthetic theory, um, there's a resistance to that kind of uh, reconciliation that Hegel had. But I think your the the criticism is is valid because there are still these notions like reconciliation or redemption, um, happiness, that seem to suggest that um, even if the negative maybe temporarily has been detached from the absolute, um, there is still some kind of driving force towards um, these, these reconciling concepts. Um, but I think uh, the danger is less apparent, I would say, in Adorno than somebody like Hegel, um, only insofar as he uh, doesn't define what this, this reconciliation or this redemption would be. And it's unclear whether it's even possible. And I think that's the key difference. So it's not that this can be achieved, but more so it functions almost like a regulative ideal, a negative regulative ideal that incites us to think, that incites us to create without hope for this kind of this closure. I mean, that's the only way I can sort of see the difference. You said in the very be you said in the very beginning about the end of art, and I had immediately to think of Francis Fukuyama's claim that we reached the end of history, right? This idea that of, of the triumph, however, right? It was this idea that the collapse of the Soviet Union, the collapse of communism, sees the triumph of liberal democracy, and this is something that should be applauded in a sense. And you know, of course, with Warner's point of view, the political spectrum, but is it not equally somehow deterministic? Then, kind of reading of reaching the end of something in this respect due to the triumph of a particular kind of emergent socio political structure. And does he contend with the notion that maybe this is, in some way, kind of triumph that we've reached a stage in which it's the end, but that's a good thing? Yeah, I don't see that so much um, in Adorno. Um, I mean, there's sort of the, if you read, uh, 
you know, Minima Moralia, for example, there's, he talks about a melancholy science or a melancholy attitude towards this kind of loss. And I tried to frame that in the beginning as being why I talked about them as liminal figures, because on the one hand, there's a recogni recognition of, a, of sort of the end of something. And of course, art has continued. It's not like art has disappeared, right? Yeah. But, but this end, um, I think there's a sort of uh, paradoxical relationship to it, where on the one hand, um, it's not so much that art has, has ended, but that the way in which art sort of um, manifested itself is, is fundamentally changed and is no longer possible. And so again, I don't think it's a triumphant stance, but more so a kind of recognition that something has been lost, um, but that uh, to rush headlong into the future would be politically, aesthetically, philosophically dangerous as well. So how do you reconcile the past with, I guess, the future or the present, I think, is more the stance that Adorno would take. Okay, thank you.